Corey Cormier. I'm CEO of Boston Research Technologies. I'm also co-founder with Dr. Shlomo Granarzi of the RAND Behavioral Finance Forum. The Finance Forum is a, uh, a forum where we bring together the world's leading uh, behavioral finance experts uh, and uh, with, the, with the world's leading financial institutions and there's an exchange of information about the latest concepts and theories of behavioral finance um, and uh, how these, uh, these ideas might be incorporated into helping um, uh, consumers optimize their decision making. We founded BFI, as we call it, uh, for behavioral finance to mainstream behavioral finance uh, concepts into the financial world, uh, a financial world that has been dom dominated by uh, standard finance. One of the most frequent questions I hear is, uh, it, is there a basic textbook I can read or course I can take to become more conversant in behavioral finance? That there are concepts in behavioral finance that I would like to incorporate into my practice. Well, there are books that include behavioral finance uh, concepts. There are books about behavioral finance, but there's no standard uh, text, uh, widely accepted text. Uh, there's also no uh, degree program in behavioral finance. But as we approach this question of what it is and why, why should I, I want to um, uh, understand it, we first want to ask you as business professionals, why would you want to be knowledgeable in the field of behavioral finance? Let's try to provide an answer. Behavioral finance is about thought leadership. Being a thought leader in your field has the primary uh, advantage uh, or outcome of, of creating great loyalty. Uh, you want, if you can talk about behavioral finance, if you can apply it to your practice, to solving problems, this is going to present you as a, a thought leader. Uh, your clients um, uh, want to be working with thought leaders. If your clients believe you're a thought leader, they believe that you will have the new ideas first. Or if not first, you will bring new ideas to the relationship very quickly after they're introduced to the markets, marketplace. So that brings up the question, what exactly is thought leadership? It's a phrase we hear all the time. Uh, if I ask 10 people what it means, I typically will get 10 different answers. Well, Dr. Chip Heath of Stanford uh, offered a definition that seems to be widely accepted. Thought leadership causes people to think differently about familiar topics and, as importantly, it changes their behavior. So if you were to tell people that here's new information about how men versus women behave uh, with respect to money management, that's information, but if it doesn't change anybody's behavior, it's not uh, thought leadership. You also see a lot of benchmark studies out there that study the, uh, the typical behavior of investment advisors or, relate, or relationship managers or you just all sorts of different professionals. This is common practices. This is not thought leadership. Thought leadership is about best practices. So why do we need behavioral finance? We have plenty of financial concepts and theories out there already. Uh, they come from classical or modern economics, they come from standard finance, uh, and these, these concepts or theories are intended to predict individuals' behavior. Um, we need behavioral finance because standard finance and economic theories do not predict behavior particularly well. BFI our experts argue uh, it does not reflect reality of how people think and therefore behave. Behavioral finance studies the psychological and sociological factors that influence the financial decision-making process of individuals, groups, and entities. In this uh, discussion, we'll be talking about the behaviors of individuals. So to, uh, to best understand behavioral finance and what it is, uh, we want to compare it to standard finance and economics. So let's start with standard finance and how it's different from behavioral finance. To do this, let's focus on two major standard finance concepts, modern portfolio theory espoused by Harry Markowitz in the 50s and efficient market hypothesis uh, introduced by economist Eugene Fama in 1970. Let's just quickly review what the two are. Uh, this is not a, a discussion of, of of the standard finance, but how uh, it's different from behavioral finance. So modern portfolio theory simply states, 
uh, an efficient portfolio that can be created for any group of stocks or bonds with the maximum or highest expected return given the amount of risk assumed or if you want to flip that uh, it contains the lowest possible risk for a given expected return. The efficient market hypothesis says that all information has already been reflected in a securities price or, or market value. Essentially, financial markets are informationally efficient. So let's, uh, let's look at some of the underlying behavioral assumptions with respect to these, these two theories and decide if they make sense. There are six uh, assumptions I'll talk about today. The first one is all investors aim to maximize economic utility, or in other words, to make as much money as possible, regardless of any other considerations. Let's think about that for a second. Uh, think about the example of green investing, for example. People are investing in green stocks and mutual funds for, thing, for reasons other than maximizing utility or making as much money as possible. They could, probably could make uh, more money investing in other stocks. Uh, second assumption, uh, all investors are rational and risk averse. Is this a good assumption? We'll be talking about what uh, risk aversion is and what rationality is. Uh, the question is, is, is it a good assumption to believe that we're all rational? Uh, a third underlying behavioral assumption to these standard finance concepts are all investors have access to the same information at the same time. We hear all the time about insider trading problems, probably uh, refuting that assumption. Investors have an accurate conception of possible returns. Is this, uh, uh, is this a good assumption? We know we'll talk about behavior, in behavioral finance. There are certain uh, cognitive biases that cause us to have different perceptions of uh, possible returns. All investors are price takers. That is, they, their actions do not influence prices. Um, we know in the stock market that there are very large invest institutional investors that do in fact affect prices. And the sixth assumption is that risk or volatility of an asset is known in advance and is constant. Um, when you think about the bubble we hit in 2008, uh, that causes us to question whether or not that assumption is correct. So going back to standard finance versus behavioral finance, uh, Dr. Meyer Statman at um, Santa Clara University, I think said it best uh, when he said, people in standard finance are rational. They are not confused by frames. They are not affected by cognitive errors. They do not know the pain of regret and they have no, uh, they have no uh, lapses of self-control. However, people in behavioral finance may not always be rational, but they are always normal. Normal people are often confused by frames, affected by cognitive errors, and know the pain of regret and the difficulty of self-control. Now let's turn to classical economics for a moment and compare that to uh, behavioral finance. One of the, uh, the essential uh, elements of classical economics is rationality. Rationality is, uh, as Dan Ariely, Dr. Dan Ariely said, is the foundation of standard economic theories, predictions, and recommendations. We are capable of making the right decisions for ourselves. He continues to say that behavioral finance allows for the possibility that we may consistently behave irrationally, which again raises the questions, who decides what is rational and what is rationality? Well, Dr. Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in Behavioral Finance uh, for his prospect theory, addressed that issue uh, about rationality and what it is and what it isn't and how it should be defined. The only test of rationality is not whether a person's beliefs and preferences are reasonable, but whether they are internally consistent. He continues to say that a rational person can believe in ghosts so long as all their other beliefs are consistent with the existence of, existence of ghosts. Or a rational person can prefer to be hated over being loved so long as his or her preferences are consistent. Rationality is logical coherence, reasonable or not. Econs, or what uh, Dr. Richard Thaler uh, calls econs, are people who live by um, strict uh, classical economic assumptions. Econs are rational by this definition, but there is overwhelming evidence that humans cannot be. Uh, Dr. Daniel Kahneman again uh, uh, 
gave a very good summarizing quote when he said, economists think about what people ought to do, psychologists watch what they actually do. So if we return uh, to this question of what exactly is behavioral finance, we also see that there is a debate uh, about the real definition and validity of behavioral finance since the field still is in its, field still is in its um, developing uh, stage and refining itself. Uh, we also find that specific viewpoints and definitions of behavioral finance is based upon the professional background of the scholar discussing it. Uh, Dr. Terry O'Dean uh, stated that people systematically depart from optimal judgment and decision making. Behavioral finance enriches economic understanding by incorporating these aspects of human nature into financial models. Uh, Richard Thaler, again, uh, defined um, behavioral economics or behavioral finance by saying DeFi is a, com is a combination of psychology and economics that investigates what happens in markets in which some of the uh, agents display human limitations and complications. Uh, it attempts to explain and increase understanding of the reasoning patterns of investors, including the emotional processes involved and the degree to which they influence decision-making processes. Finally, he said, economics traditionally conceptualizes a world popular, pop, populated by a calculating un, um, unemotional maximizers that have been dubbed homo economicus. Having solved for the optimum, homo economicus is next assumed to choose the optimum. In this, uh, in, in this, uh, in this brief introduction to behavioral economics and behavioral finance, I've attempted to explain to you why you would want to know about it, how it's different from standard finance and economics, and how it can help you in your practice. Thank you.